Okay, so this is exciting. We have John Fair with us and Mike with us again. John, how have you been? Good, good. How have good. you guys been doing? Trucking along, trying to yeah, stay Mike, healthy. <laughs> Mike told, told me about that semi. Oh my the, gosh. Yeah, and you know what I brought? I was talking to my mom today. I brought it up to her, you know, because she lives in Tempe. And she's like, oh, God, yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> so, you know, obviously yeah. it was all over the news. It was super crazy. And I was recording one of these with a friend of mine last week and got the whole crash sound on it and everything. It's just crazy. Oh, oh it was that loud? It, it was, was that loud. loud. Yeah. And then about 30 minutes later, you heard the sirens show up. And yeah, it's all on the last week's podcast. Yeah, my mom was saying that uh, uh, that semi was just like, I don't know, a few feet away from smashing and killing the whole family in the house. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. A couple the of guy that the guy that died actually, I think he was out in the garage. He probably yeah, was out, the, the, he might have been out having a smoke or something and the truck went all the way through the house, pinned him between the, the front of the truck and the car and, and and killed him. It was I've never heard anything quite what? like that in my life. It was it didn't sound like a car accident. It was just this loud, just loud rumble for like about five seconds. It was enough to bring all the neighbors outside to see what was going on. But well, it's um, our house. There was no sirens or anything. That they they all came up yeah. quiet. And um, but yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's just that's awful. Yeah, it's yeah. horrible for them. I mean, it was New Year's Eve. They were waiting for pizza. It was a family get together, a New Year's Eve party, and. You know, now I, I just drove by there um, yesterday on the way home from work and the, the house is completely boarded up. I, I don't even know if it's structurally sound anymore. They're probably, oh, they're probably about to tear it down. <sighs> well, other than that, how was your New Year's? All was, all was good here. Yeah, nothing weird happened around here. But, you know, like I sent in that last email, when I was writing to you, I was thinking, you know what? It, I, you know, I was thinking, I'm like, God, it was weird. I, I didn't even hear one firework. That's weird. I know nothing. It was. They like, must have been. They must have been vacationing out here because that's all we heard. <laughs> Nonstop. Nonstop I, fireworks. Honey, I didn't hear any. Did you? Mm -mm. No. Yeah, I didn't even think anything of it until I was typing to you. I'm like, wait a minute, that was just bizarre. And especially to, we live on a main street and uh, in a neighborhood um and you know where you, you know some people start doing that at like nine o'clock at night nothing nothing yeah, yeah. so what is that yeah what was that sounds like a robot <laughs> you know, <laughs> I thought you were writing some bad yeah, tech music. music. Is, is the Roomba is the Roomba involved in this in this conversation now? <laughs> no, but I just got a message that said high CPU is affecting video something or other. I have no idea what's going on with my computer. I think you need to clear some yeah, of the files. Yeah, CPU you know. in, in that machine. Yeah. Well, hopefully it won't jack this up, but um. So anyways, last week we talked a bunch about music. So uh, you guys should talk about music. Well, first of all, let's explain to John your format here, which is um, the guest gets to sort of drive. Uh, yeah. For this, I'm just sort of like the moder I'm Tara's the moderator and I'm just gonna be sort of like the um, sidekick. So John, you get to talk about what you want and um, we'll just go along and Tara will. Yeah. Keep it moving when it gets slow, and we'll just see where, where it goes. It's sort of the fun of all this. Oh, God. You're going to leave that on me. Well, I mean. You know, just start <laughs> talking. Yeah, let's, I mean. Tara, start talking about something. I don't even know what to say. Okay, all right. Okay, I'll, 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 start. I'll start it. I'll start okay. it. All right, go. All right. It's, okay, tell us the story about how you two met. Oh, I remember how I met him. Um. 
Uh, Mike, what year was that? That was like 80. It was 1982. Two? Or, no, it was 82? Uh, yeah, 1982. Yeah, yeah, I remember I was still a junior in high school. Yeah. Um, well, I had gone to that, that hardcore, that, you know, that California hardcore punk stage. And, and I was starting to kind of get tired of that. And he had a band with another guy. Uh, oh, God, I can't, can't I think of his name. Eric. Eric. Yeah, it was Eric and Michael. Well, oh, he was in it? Yeah, Michael was in it. Uh, before I, I joined? Yeah. Anyway, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You guys listed uh, well you put an ad in the new times yep. you needed a drummer yeah and then i came over to your house yeah. but you mentioned you were into bands like echo and the Bunnymen. i remember that yeah i think the ad said like echo and the Bunnymen killing joe yeah yeah and, and i remember you came over and i think your your buddy D danny peterson came over with you oh did he yeah Do you i'm know pretty sure and we were know, just hanging out in my garage. Um, not not to veer off. Do you know he passed away? Yes, I do. Yeah, I remember we had discussed that. Oh, wow, a lot of people from back then passed away. It's um, yeah, drug overdose. Yeah, and unfortunately, with the music world, it's you know a lot of people pass too early. Yeah. Yeah, and he wasn't even involved in that anymore. Guy was working towards his PhD. Really. Yeah, I think in like electrical engineering or something like that. He was living in Utah and okay. he wasn't, he wasn't even, he was off the drug. But something, I guess something bad happened and, and then he went back to it and whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, yeah, I didn't remember him being with me. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was a drummer for a long time. Yeah. Actually, until me, you, and Brian. Yes. We're working together and got the first drum machine. Yeah, yeah. Which Brian Brian got. Yeah, it was, oh. um, I don't know if his first drum machine was the Drumulator or not, but I know that that was the drum machine that we used in Laura's toy quite a bit. It's a, a powerhouse sounding drum machine. I mean, it definitely has a unique sound and it was, and he programmed in a very driving manner. He so, did. He was he was great at that, wasn't he? Yeah, he was pretty good. Yeah, at that it. was a great drum scene. You know <laughs> what's funny about that? When I was with Catterwall, um, we we we'd get invited to these like little private party things, and we went to this one with uh, at uh, do you remember the Scream Club yes. in LA? They, they had a lot of them there. Anyway. It was with Front 242, and I was talking to the singer, and I said, hey, man, you guys on that back catalog album, you use a, the, the drum elator a lot, right? And he went, yeah. I'm like, hey, man, don't feel bad about it. That thing was great. Yeah. Plus, it wasn't cheap by any means. I remember Brian paid a fortune for that thing used. Yeah, and, and, and it was a... It was a power. I mean, that that was a, a very powerful sounding drum machine. I mean, we I thought so. We, we um just put it to cassette when we played live. And it, I mean, we sounded really rock solid live in Laura's toy. I mean, I, I don't know if you remember, but I mean, a lot of times in those early shows with Laura's toy, the sound guys were just like treating us really bad. But then once we would play, they were always pretty impressed, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, you know what I remember what they hated is that we always wanted to run direct into the board and oh we don't have those direct boxes around here I have to go call another club you know I think that was an issue it was an issue which is hilarious because it's such a crock of um of shit because when when Lycia went out and toured in the 90s when Tara me and Dave went out but in particular when just Tara and I went out um, I used to get that same stuff from the sound guy saying, I'm going to need direct boxes. And I'm like, no, just relax, dude. And I'd pull out these two quarter inch to um, XLR adapters that I got at Radio Shack for like $12 a piece. And I would say, just take these and plug them into your snake. Uh, and, you know, oh, and, and right. it worked perfect every time. In fact, there was a sound guy in New York City um, at downtime and he actually had done um, live sound for the clash. 
And every time we'd come around, he was a real, he was a real, you know, abrasive New York guy. And he would always hassle the bands, but he loved us because he would say, Oh, here's Lycia. They always come prepared. They're always ready. And it was just because of those two Radio Shack adapters. That's, that's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we would have had that back then, the guy would have thrown a hissy fit. And we could say, eh, dude, relax, man. $12. You don't need to spend $100 for a DI box. Here you go. Radio Shack. Right. right. Yeah, I never yeah. actually never would have thought of it. You said quarter inch to XLR. I, yeah. I didn't even really had that. Well, what I did, what we did in the '90s when we toured is that I would submix on stage. I um, would have everything going through a little Mackie mixer, and then I would just run out the left and right and say, "There you go. There's all our music." And um, even for a while, I would do my own vocals. It it was difficult um, <laughs> running the smoke machine, the lights, playing guitar, singing, and running the mix. I often Here's joke that I put, your knees. Yeah, I put a couple cymbals between my knees, and hey, there we go. All right. Uh, I digress. Let's get back to um, let's get back to the eighties. Um, yeah, I want to hear the story. How you guys met? Yeah, let's get back to nineteen eighty two. Um, with Eric, Eric and I were in a band called Mister Three Hundred with Michael Irwin and the mysterious drummer, only known as Tom, because no one can remember his his last name. I talked to Michael about, and we can't remember, but. Um, that band just sort of fell apart in the summer of 82 and Eric and I decided we were going to do something. We placed an ad in new times. And like often when you place um, musicians wanted ads, a good portion of the people were duds. And John came over with his buddy and his drum kit. And the first thing I noticed was he had this drum style that it was different than all the other drummers I heard who were all rock and roll drummers. John played like, Joy Division and like Echo and the Bunny Man. And I was immediately sold. I was like, this guy, we got to have him in the band right then and there. And even though Eric was out of college already and I was um, getting ready to go into college and I was already out of high school and John was younger, I just knew he was the guy we needed in the band and a perfect choice because John and I are still working together. Yeah. All these way. Yeah. Well, actually, it was you and I that. Kind of went went off. Eric left that band because we wanted to do more. I don't know, kind of more Bauhaus kind of stuff, right? That's exactly it. Um, you know, that band we did with Eric really just sort of stalled. I I was thinking about that in preparation for this discussion. Probably because we never found a singer. We never found a singer. We only practiced like once a week. Sometimes we would miss that. We never played any shows. We played the same songs over and over. And it really got to the point where we weren't really doing anything anymore. And Eric came in. Well, first of all, let me backtrack. I like Eric a lot. He's a cool dude. But he wanted us to become a folk man or a surf man. And we, neither of us were into that. You know, we, I remember I went and I listened to a Killing Joke album after he was pitching he won there was some band called the fabulous baggies or something some obscure record he found he brought it to practice because we got to sound like that and when he left i went and listened to um killing joke and i was like i can't I, we got to go back to do what we want to <laughs> do and i think i called you shortly after i said we got to make a change and that's when i decided to call erwin and i believe you contacted jim palmer and field to shadow was born like almost immediately after that yeah. Was the band with Eric and and John and John was that Edie? No, was no, that after? was with that was with Palmer and yeah. and God, why did we change the name to? And that was Edie Sedgwick. Yeah, I was totally not in. I was completely not into that. We had um, Fields of Shadow broke up in the fall of '83, and it's essentially the same band. Yeah, Edie. we Just we got name. back together. Yep, we got back together in early 84. And I remember we were practicing over at the greenhouse over there in Tempe, over by the police station. And Jim just came in and said, we need to have a, a, a name change and a style change. And it all went downhill from there. You know, shortly after that, you know, you left the band, you know, Jim wanted to take it in a different direction. And I, I was such a passive member after that. And we literally just worked in after you left and we played one show and I quit the next day because the show was so bad. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I remember that. It was just... do, you remember, do you remember Irwin fell out of the top window of that? Yes. Greenhouse. Yep, and they um they taped off the ground where he had fallen, and they wrote R.I.P. Mister Seventy Five because everyone remembered Mister Three Hundred because we had a we played about a dozen shows oh, the right. summer of eighty two, and so he was known <laughs> as Mister Three Hundred, and so since he was Tara, singer, you should have saw this house. Yeah. It was this old Victorian. You would you would never recognize um, Old Town Ten P. It was a lot of old Victorians down there um and, I think there was and, uh, no I, it, uh, it wasn't there that house was in between where the police station is now and sun devil stadium and there was a house there so you could play as loud as you want because the police station was next door and often numerous bands were practicing there at the same time yeah it was down there right where the yeah right with the same same street it was right there yeah and um yeah, it was this big old two-story Victorian house that was it was run down. I think they gave it to the guy. I think the guy, that dude, he was a guy that Erwin went to college with, wasn't he? Because I remember, I think he was the same studio art, studio art major at ASU like myself and and, and Michael. Um, Ed, wasn't that his name? Yeah, Something like Ed. That. I think it was Ed, yeah. Um, it stunk. I don't know if you remember because oh, yeah, those old homes kind of have open grates to the sewer. It yeah. stunk in there. It was awful. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, they had parties there every single weekend. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the guy didn't. I think they just gave him the house. He didn't have to pay for anything. He didn't pay him more. Well, and that guy also was responsible for, I think he booked at clubs. He might have booked at the Devil House. And so all oh, the yeah. bands knew him. So uh, I remember one time we were practicing inside the house and there was a reggae band practicing on the balcony outside at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that place was huge, if you, if you remember. Yeah, I remember. I remember one time I went upstairs <clears throat> and... There was like this weird door and you opened it up and it was into this attic space and I, and I don't know who was with me. I think Jim was up there with me and we opened it up and this homeless guy climbed out, scared the shit out of us. <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me because the yeah. thing was, the house was open all the time. That dude was never there. He lived there. Can you imagine living in that? I mean, yeah, it was so bizarre. weird. No I mean, it was just like open to the public. There was nothing up there. Yeah. I know. It was creepy. Yeah. God. Can you imagine being asleep at night in there? Uh, yeah. Just different different times. <laughs> yeah, man. God, that's so that gives me the creeps now that I think about it. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't live in there, just that stink. <laughs> so no, I don't. Go ahead. I don't have COVID. I got <coughs> <laughs> I got dog hair in my throat. You know what? Every time I cough or sneeze or something, I feel like saying that to people. No, I don't have COVID. It's all right. Calm down. Don't yeah. worry. I'll wash it down with this tasty beer. God. Hey, I want a beer. <sighs> Refreshing. Yeah, I, I know. Like, I'm paranoid about that in public. <clears throat> yeah. We're, we're being uh, as safe as possible. Um, yeah. I see. I see. Cases are pretty high there. You know, there was this In and Out Burger that opened here on the other side of town. And how long has that been here? Like two months at the most. Nicole, in that short period of time, there was a damn seventy cases of COVID from the employees. <laughs> oh my yeah. god! Come on, we really. That's yeah. just taking zero precautions at all. Yeah, I, it, I, you know what? It, it, I, it really makes me angry. I mean, it makes me really, really angry. Yeah. You know, I want to go. I just want to go in there and scream at these people. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, we feel your pain. Um, we live in a part of town here where there's a lot of deniers out here, and. Um, Today, just, hey, just today made, in sir. Arizona. Yeah, we had 10,000 cases in Arizona today. Um, we have the highest rate in the world. 
And so we, we never leave the house. Dirk um, remotes schools and Tara works from home. And I, I, I work, work two days a week in the office and two weeks I remote in. But when I go to the office, I double mask it. I keep to myself. But um, How far away do you work? Where do you work? I work, I, well, I don't want to say it in, <laughs> in a public No, I meant thing, the city. I work, I work in the same town I live in. Oh, okay. In the east part of um, the Phoenix metro area. <laughs> and um, it's not a long drive, um, and I don't really particularly mind going in there if it wasn't for COVID. Um, right, right. But um, there's, you know, I work with some people that are de deniers also, and so they, you know, they don't really take it serious. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a paranoid dude, so I'm I double mask, and well, my I, hands are I, completely I, raw from washing and sanitizer. That's how we are, um, Lucius. You know, my stepson, he's a good kid. I mean, that kid doesn't, he won't even step out in front of the house without a mask on. Now he, he's, I know, he's a good boy. He's 18 now. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's like, what? Yeah, I think it's like been 10 years since the last time you guys saw him. Yeah. No. Anyway, he, he's, yeah, he's doing school remotely, but his school was talking about, well, uh, you know how the, these people handle this stuff. In a couple of weeks, you know, he can, you know, come back, you know, come, go to school for a day and then, you know, d do it yeah. at home for a day and then, you know, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, 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 that makes sense because in a couple of weeks, COVID will be gone. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, uh, come on, damn it. You know, I mean, it's the middle of the school year. Let him finish it at home. I really do want to write to his school and say, look, you've already had a case there. You know, these kids, they don't, they don't want to do what they're supposed to do. I can't hardly blame them. That's hard on them. Yeah. Not what they're used to. Let the kid finish at home. He's a senior now, you know, and which I think blows because the kid's probably going to miss his graduation. He's going to miss and all that stuff. Prom, exactly. The, the kids last year did. Yeah. So I know. And he doesn't get to spend his last year with all his buddies and stuff. And Right, and that's bumming him out. Yeah. You know what? His one of his best friends. This is weird. One of his best friends lives right next door to us. I mean, their house is literally stuck up against ours, and he never sees the kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we moved. What two months ago? And I think I've only seen that kid once. Yeah. And he's there all the time because he graduated. He's a year older. Wow. So I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. We say that a lot too. You have to just dial yeah. back in and say, yeah, it is. Just well, you know, what we've been doing is, um, you know, because there's a lot of wildlife mm -hmm. around here. We, uh, we live really close to Cheyenne Mountain. You know, you walk outside of front of it's right there. Actually, I'm surprised that I'm getting a good signal right now because the mountain usually kind of kills it. Huh. Um, yeah, there's, you know, like you go outside, there's deer in the front yard all the time. And then in the summer, bears. It's kind of creepy. But anyway, there's, you know, all that around. So we just go out and walk around that stuff. And yeah. It, you know, it's beautiful. So, you know, you guys are both from the midwest i mean you know what that's like to be out and stuff yeah. like that, so. our apartment in ohio that we lived for six years we were just telling Dirk about all the animals we used to see off our our balcony um every night raccoons possums skunks deer um, yep. a giant snapping turtle one time remember that yeah that's well, we weird had, we have wildlife around here too. Um, just a couple of days ago, I went out and did a midday walk and and walked around the corner and I saw this dog standing in front of me and when I focused in, it was a coyote standing there just looking at me. And um, we've had yeah. bears around here too, come out of the mountains with trying to look for water. And we had a mountain lion around here too, came in and killed a dog in the backyard about a mile south of here. Yeah, those things are nasty. What was it? Oh, bobcat. Yeah, yeah we just bobcats around here. Yeah, it, it's we. You probably 
remember what this was like. You know, I'd go outside at night. I don't, I don't know where this crap comes from. I'd go, I'd go outside at night, you know, and there's, you, you can tell when something's been around in the snow. You yeah. see the track. I'd go outside at yeah. night and have a cigarette. And like, what the hell? You know, it's clearly bobcat tracks. I'm like, good God, I just missed God. that. <laughs> it does, those things have little man syndrome. You don't want to get near them. No. <laughs> little cat syndrome. Little cat syndrome. And one day, Nicole coming home from work late at night was turning the corner and was face to face with a bear. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. That's pretty bad. Yeah, luckily it scared the bear. Yeah. yeah. It was like a cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what? but you know, and then of course, those things are always the mama bear with their babies nearby. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, the 80s. Uh, <laughs> was, you know, maybe to, maybe to spur some of your memories here, uh, when Tara and I were doing this last week, I don't know how we got there. But we started talking about the um, the very early 80s Phoenix punk scene. And, and she actually brought up um, Frank Discussion in the feeders and um, Doug Clark and maybe Mental and all those those people. And it was sort of fun talking about that. And since you were part of that hardcore punk scene before me and you started working. Yeah, together, I saw, you probably I saw. some interesting um, observations about those mad garden days. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, oh. That, you know, there's a lot of, yeah, I, I I remember those guys. Well, you know, well, not so much Doug Clark, um, but, oh, God, who, who's the other guy, the guy that played keyboards that was in Maybe Mental? That guy was pretty um, brilliant. Dave Oliphant. In fact, I'm um, Tara's friends with him. Um, he's he's continued to create great music over the years. He um, after maybe Mental, he was in a band that I really dug a lot, which is Lifeguard, and that band also featured of all people oh. Bill Ward um, from uh, from Jim uh, no from um, Grant the Geezers and oh, Grant the Geezers. Um, that's right. I'm sorry. Bill Bill Ward and he played in like about every every style of music you can imagine but um it was always like sort of you know ba real band oriented stuff but life life garden was a real was an experimental ambient band and um, yeah i remember hearing yeah. the name but i i had in, in the discussion i had with tara i recalled that show we did with um in fields of shadow we did with maybe mental and um doug clark was playing guitar with maybe mental and I remember what an influence that had on me because there was a keyboard player, there was a guitar player with a lot of effects, and there was a singer. And if you think about it, that sort of became what Lycia became in the 90s. And so that had an influence on me. You talk about the, the baby bear, the mama bear and baby bear, or the, the, the bobcat, the, the small cat syndrome. I, back in the 80s, I don't know how you felt, but... I was never part of the underground. I was always in Tempe and sort of more accessible bands. And I always craved to be part of that underground. And so I was really cool when, we, when, when Field of Shadow got to play with um, Maybe Mental because Bef Mr. 300 always played like at Merlin's and with, with the commercial bands. And I always felt like I was lacking underground credibility. And so it was sort of cool to connect for that brief time and play with those bands. And then and I remember in the late 80s, when we and you really got Lycia going, it was, I really felt great that we were like tapping into the underground. Yeah, well, I mean, I can't say that I was ever really part of it. I mean, I was in that little punk band. We played Mad Gardens, but, you know, and some other, oh, there were some other crappy little venues that, God, I'm trying to think of the guy's name that, oh, in the band that the guy was in. I can't, I can't think of his name. What band? I can't, it was, um, was, there, was there a band called Human Hands? 
No. I actually discussed human hands in our, in the last podcast because you might not know this, but when I um, put my very first um, ad in um, in nineteen. 19- 81 the fall of 81 and my very first ad in new times one of the very first people to call me was david wiley from human hands that's who it was david wiley yeah david he is very, and i talked to him numerous times in the fall of 81 and he wanted to form a band with me um just oh, based on their conversations yeah but um as you all know going down to those underground places it was you know, being a suburban kid, those those underground places in Phoenix were sort of scary. And um, yeah, they were. So I, was, I was very intimidated when he wanted me to come over to Phoenix and jam with them. Um, I well, you and I were him. just kids, you know. Yeah, I had seen him one time in person. Um, I went to Mad Gardens, and um, I don't know, the, I don't know all the bands that were playing that night, but one of the bands playing was um, Africa Core which became Savage Republic. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was really in with those people when he was in California. So he went on stage and was playing in like a, like a, uh, some kind of like trash can or something with them really, in a really big way. And, David Wiley was? Yeah. And um, he sort of, sort of scared me because he looked sort of like, um, he looked like a kid. Like he was yeah. a grown up kid. And yeah. then he was, it, and, and all those people seemed to me, at least being a, a, a naive, tempy kid, they all seemed like they were into really weird stuff and it scared me. It fascinated me, but it scared me. I was much more comfortable just going back to Tempe and thus why I was in all those more, like the bands in Tempe were tended to be more accessible in New Wave and the bands from Phoenix, as I remember, tend to be more arty and experimental cool. and less scary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know exactly how you, how, how you felt. Um, well, yeah, we were kids, and yeah, you know, I, they were a lot older than us. Yeah, they were about maybe, maybe, maybe close to ten years older than us, and they had, um, you know, when you're just a kid and you're you're in that atmosphere and you're used to just the, the simplicities of the suburbs and your idea of music is just going to the record store and listening to your favorite bands. And then suddenly you're in these seedy clubs and you're seeing all well, these yeah. people. It's sort of scary. Yeah. Yeah. It was for me too. I thought it was just me to be perfectly honest. <laughs> oh, I used to, I always felt out of place. I mean, even in Tempe playing at those in my in Mr. 300, we play at like Merlin's and Tony's New Yorker. When the shows would be done, everyone would go party, and I would just hightail at home and I'd be at my parents' house watching TV. Oh. An hour hour later, just watching TV, and they were all out partying. I, I always felt alienated by that. Then I was very intimidated. Yeah, yeah, I would have too. I mean. Well, you you have to bear in mind when I was going to ba- Mad Gardens, you know, I was just a teenager, but I was going there with, you know, with Danny Peterson and like, you know, uh, I don't remember who was giving us rides there, and and you know, and Danny just lived down the street from me, so, you know, after yeah. that crap was over, we just went right home. Yeah, we weren't yeah. You know, hanging around with those, with those guys that were older than us they wouldn't want to hang around with a bunch of kids anyway yeah so it's funny because i think about uh, um when we finally got lycia going in the late 80s i remember we used to think about how you know we went from being the naive kids to now suddenly we were like the, the scary scary guys because know. you know we were like drinking like fish and doing other things we probably shouldn't have been doing and <laughs> And yeah, nonstop. Everything was about music. I was in the I I don't know if it was me and Tara in our in the episode I did with her just by myself or um just us talking around the house. But man, those days in um Tempe in the late 80s when we were doing the early days of life, I mean, I just I never slept. I you know, I'd get home from work and then you'd show up and we'd be working on music and then you'd leave and I would mix music and I'd finally say, Oh my god, I gotta be going to work here. I get at least an hour's sleep and I would just do it over and over and over again. 
I remember one time in that in that little studio apartment you had, you know, the early days of life. Yeah. And I was sitting in your chair and it was really you and I had been out <clears throat> with some of our other friends drinking and crap and and then we came back there and you were you were mixing music and then I don't know what happened. I just remember I don't know how much later you waking me up from that that chair I was sitting in. You're like, hey, listen to this. Well, <laughs> what? Where am I? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's, I miss that. I miss those days because it was, I was so just focused in on the band. And I was telling Tara about how, you know, most of the bands that I played in the 80s, I, it was all about imitating your, 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 your favorite bands and trying to sound like them. But when me and you did Lycia, we, we, we crossed this line at one point where suddenly we realized we had our sound. And from that point on, it was like, okay, we got this sound and it's special and it's unique. And at that point it was, you know, going for broke. I mean, I, I just wanted it to succeed so bad. I didn't care if I didn't sleep. I didn't care if it affected my health. It was just all about the lifestyle of this sort of this gloom and doom new band that we had and just throwing, throwing yourself into it. And I still listen to those demos on a somewhat regular basis because it just represents this discovery of what you're doing as opposed to just imitating people. And it was really the start of everything that came afterwards. Yeah. Well, you know, those, those demos post online, you know, by that, we weren't imitating anybody by that point. No. So, you know, and that even, was just us. Yeah, yeah. And even our influence at the time, it really, it really changed because I think in the, at least for me in the eighties, it was all about imitating, you know, maybe, um, you know, the initial post-punk bands from England, but by the time we got to Lycia, the way I remembered, for me at least, was I was trying to mix the lushness of Cocktoo Twins with the sort of noisy abrasiveness of Big Black, which are two things that you wouldn't think would mix together. And if you think about it, our early demos really sort of represent that. No, that, yeah, that works. It does, it does work. Yeah. No. And I think that might have been the premise of our initial sound. But once we did those first couple songs, you know, I, I, I think From Foam might have been the first song we did. And it was. I, I just remember after hearing that thinking, oh, my God, this is this is what I've been wanting to do since the early 80s. And I don't know what took us so long, because I truly believe it. If, if, I don't know, but it, it, I think it worked right out of the gate. Yeah, I did. And I think if me and you would have in 1982, when we first met, would have just had a drum machine and a four track recorder and a bass. I yeah, think it would have been. Doing that. I really think we would have been doing that stuff in 82. I, I really do. Because we always talked about doing things that we eventually did in Lycia, because I don't think the bands we were in really went as far as what we wanted to go. Um, it was probably just the equipment. I mean, we didn't have equipment. Money. No equipment. I mean, I right. remember, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was finishing up college, this guy, he needed my help on something. And so I, he just needed, he just needed my notes. So I gave him, I gave him my notes and he copied them down and enabled him to pass his class. And he was so thankful that he brought me this massive, bag of pot that he grew in his backyard it was massive <laughs> we didn't know what to do with it so i, I told you about it and i think danny peterson oh that's it. right <laughs> and we went to radio shack and bought a pa with it that's right i remember that bag of pot. and then your mom was like where did you get that at and you finally fessed up to her and she made you take it back and we ended up with no pa really <laughs> Nothing, it was lost at all. But I guess it's only fitting because I mean, <laughs> Peterson sold that 
pot to the meat puppets. He sold it to the meat puppets. <laughs> and then we got a Radio Shack PA out of the deal that your mom <laughs> derailed because it was wrong. <laughs> At least I didn't realize he had sold it to the meat puppets. That's hilarious. At least that's what he claimed. I remember that distinctly. Well, they were in Tempe at the time, so that makes sense. They were, but I yeah. would remember thinking, what the hell? The meat puppets could get better pot than this. Yeah, because it was. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't I good remember, pot. I didn't know what to do with it at first, so I just put it in the trunk of my car and I'm driving around. Pretty soon, my car started smelling really funny. You know, I don't know if I told you this, Mike. But that backup pot was hidden in my dresser or my bedroom, okay, when I lived with my parents. Yeah. And my, my dad, God rest his soul, <laughs> I love the man, but he was, I don't know if you remember my dad, he was I always remember, looking yeah. for something to yell at me about. Yeah. Anyway, he was digging through my room for something, and he found in the that pot was in the bottom dresser drawer and on the top dresser drawer i had a flower from some girl you know saved in a book so it was all yeah. dried up i come home and he's like all right mister i want to know what this is <laughs> and i found something in your room i'm like oh shit he found the pot <laughs> and it was <laughs> like that it's a rose what do you <laughs> i know <laughs> crazy i know yeah I, that's funny because i never knew that danny had sold that to the meat puppets i mean what a small what a small little world i know <laughs> yeah yeah and really? I'm, I'm sure he didn't i'm sure he conjured up money for himself because we had no idea what he was doing was getting stoned we were just so damn naive then we didn't know like, is this worth something I, have well, I knew it wasn't good pot though so that's yeah, why I mean, i'm thinking come on me puppets the king of pot smokers i don't want that crap they probably bought it and were like man, man that guy's a dick <laughs> this is bad as crap yeah oh, there i think we oh there you uh -oh, go hold on a minute we lost you for a second we're yeah. good now give me a second i gotta plug in my phone it was i gotta plug it in <laughs> Picture the dancing um, snacks going by right now for the intermission. Let's go off to the feed or whatever that thing was. <laughs> go get us some popcorn. Okay, I got to plug in. Now. Pot. Oh, well, you know, uh, I actually was seeing, oh, damn, what's his name? The bass player from Meat Puppets, Mike. Um, was it Chris? Chris Kurtwood? Chris, Chris, Chris. Yeah. yeah, I was seeing him the later days of, you know, the shop I had in Tempe yeah. before moving here. Um, we had printed, we had printed a shirt for him for his girlfriend to help raise money for him because he had gotten in trouble. Yeah, yeah, I remember and that. I, I won't go into it, you know, Chris and deserves his privacy but anyway he yeah. and i became pretty good friends um those guys are great actually i mean i you know chris and his brother his brother at that time too which was about a year before me moving here like 2015 i think it was they, they had put out a new album but um chris was still in chris was still in phoenix his brother moved, Kirk moved to um, Texas, I think. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're great musicians. Yeah. yeah you know, but <clears throat> yeah, Chris is a real nice guy. I think some, I think one of the better shows I ever saw at the Sun Club was the Meat Puppets. You know, they always get, they always did a good show. And I had seen them at Mad Guards too, but that, that, Matt, when I saw them at Mad Guards, it was just sort of, noise you know as you remember back in those early days they were sort of just really yeah they changed dramatically but they were really tight when i when in fact you might have been there with me when we saw them at the sun club and they were just real rock solid you know what i would say 99.9 .9 percent of the times i was at the sun club was with you so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. probably and you know we did see some good stuff there i remember um 
Uh, speaking of um, Bill Board, we saw his band 24 Hour World, which I was really impressed with. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought they were really good. And um, I think uh, uh, there were some other musicians in that band that were from the underground, but they were really heavy and moody. And um, I know that the Sun Club crowd really didn't dig a, that, dig them because they were all into the jangly bands. But I remember me and you, every time we'd go there and there'd be a, a band like that, we always felt um, like, all right, finally something good. But I mean, it was the local watering hole and we, we didn't fit in at all in regards to the music. But I mean, we knew all, we knew a lot of those people that went on to be in jangle rock bands. I mean, if I remember right, didn't you actually audition for the Psalms one time? Do I remember? That? Am I remembering that right? Did you go and drum for them? No, I never did that. But I'll tell you what happened was, um, remember, um, what was his name? Doug Hopkins. Yeah. Um, remember, he was coming to our practices all the time. Yeah. Or not all the time, but a few but he times. He came to a couple of our practices, yeah. So he, he tried to, he tried to get me away from you and Eric. I, but I, I wasn't interested. Well, especially because, you know, his his style was leaning more towards that, the way you put it, that jingly jangly that happened. Yeah. He tried way. coaching me also at another time. Um, Did he? He was a nice guy. He's a nice guy, and um. I remember it was around the time of Field of Shadow. He approached Irwin and said, I want to get um, Mike and John in the band. And Michael asked him, well, what are, what are you, if I remember right, I mean, my, my memory's fuzzy. I don't know if it was Mike. I'm thinking it was Michael. But I, all I remember is that um, Michael asked him what he was, what kind of music he was into. And Doug said he wanted to sound like Van Morrison. And he goes, oh, you don't want to get in with these guys then because they're into like virgin prunes and so that would be <laughs> i mean you talk about ironically they're both from ireland but um yeah that's we, we were taking a very different path at that point uh, but i think it's very strange that it's probably the most commercially successful band from arizona um from you know the 80s on the guy that wrote most of their songs tried to poach you know this underground these two underground guys um, but I also remember, I, I don't know if you remember this, but one time we were, um, I don't know what we were doing. We were up at ASU or something. Fishbone was playing uh, like outside and Doug came over and was hanging out with us and, and he was just hanging out with us and being, you know, as evasive as he always is and quiet. Do you remember that? Did we lose him? No, I'm here. Oh, okay. Do you remember that? Um, it was that Manzanita Hall or something. Fishbone was playing outside. And me and you were there. And uh, Doug just came and sat with us and he was like smoking pot or something. I can't remember. There were I don't remember that, but there was an apartment that me and Brian were living in one summer in Tempe, you know, down there in Sin City. Brian. Yeah, me and Brian lived in an apartment in that same complex like about two years later. <laughs> oh, yeah. did you? Yeah. Um Oh, that's right. You did. Um, well, Doug was I, uh, Brian and I because we, we weren't we didn't work. Doug, we had parties all the time, and Doug was showing up there all the time, and you know Brian didn't really know him, but uh, I mean, he was probably showing up there because you know the history, you know, with you, me and you, Just he was showing up there a lot. And I know he was trying to crash there. I was like, oh, Doug, you, you can't. Yeah. I can't let you do that. I should have let him. What the hell is he? What, what, what would he harm? Yeah. You just drank all your beer. But it, it kind of, it wasn't really my apartment, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, hell, when he was showing up there, the, the poor guy was so hammered drunk all the time. He probably wouldn't have drank any beer. He probably just fell asleep in the corner. You know, the last couple of times I saw, last time, couple of times I saw Doug um, was when me and you lived over off of Beck Street. And I used to ride the bus home from my job and I'd walk like 
a mile and a half from the bus stop home. And I, I saw him a couple of times sitting on that wall in front of that Rollins market where we used to go buy our beer and cigarettes. And he would just, oh, yeah. I'm like, why? I, I, I briefly talked to him a couple of times, but I often wonder what the hell is he doing? He's just sitting out here drinking a beer on a, a little wall out in, in front of the scummy market, you know? Doug Hopkins was hanging out there? Yeah, I saw him a couple of times there. How weird. Just, just sitting there by himself. I mean, it's weird. Yeah. And yeah, that market was like kind of, you know, you wouldn't even know that market was there if you didn't live in that area. Yeah. That, um, yeah. Me and Will nicknamed that thing, that place Rollins, because it was called Rollins Market. We, we, we renamed it Rollins Scum Market. It was. And, uh, yeah. It was scum, scum. And I remember, Every day I'd come home from work and I would stop in that market and I'd go in there and buy cigarettes and beer. But if I didn't buy one of the two, the guy would say, no cigarettes today? It's no the today? same thing to me. Yeah. Because that's all I was buying. There was beer and cigarettes and yeah, burritos. Everyone else, you know. You know and telling- burritos because you and I weren't exactly eating well because we put more stock into beer and cigarettes. Yeah. I was I was telling Tara about when we lived in that apartment on Beck Street. I don't know if you remember this, but remember that, remember that guy that lived next door to us, and he wanted us to form a funk band with him. No, and no. he. But then again, he, I was drunk a lot. Drunk. He was like, uh, he was probably forty years old. He was from Ohio, and he was African American, and he had played in a funk band before and he heard us playing and he came over and wanted us to be in his band and i remember him saying now one thing you guys are going to have to do is you're going to have to do the dance steps <laughs> i don't remember that yeah what a fantastic what, what? <laughs> and i remember what, another time what? yeah i also what, remember like another time band? Over, yeah he, and i remember another time he came over and he was like i need you guys to do me a favor I need to tell my girlfriend because he was living next door with his girlfriend. I needed to tell 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 her that I was hanging out with you guys last night. Oh, Lord. <laughs> because, was everybody that was around us when you and I were younger lunatics? I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? You know this is totally off the subject, but I remember one time you and I crashing a party, and it was in the early Lycia days. Crashing this party and God, there were some really crappy dump houses in Tempe around campus, wasn't there? That are all gone now. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was this. It was it was the girlfriend of a guy you and I knew, and we crashed this party and we, you were you were smoking a cigarette and it was right near these dips that she had on this table and she's like, "Hey, do I know you guys?" And you said, and I've told the story to Nicole a bunch of times. You said, no, I'm just here flicking ashes in your bean dip. <laughs> and she goes, I don't have any bean dip. <laughs> like, I was like, this dude was so weird when he was drunk. Well, you know, you figure back then... Uh, I didn't eat anything. I was skinny as a rail. I drank like a fish. I smoked nonstop. And then we did the other stuff, which would lead to like maybe sometimes days of without sleep. And I spent all my time, you know, mixing music and living this nonstop music lifestyle. (laughs) It gives you a, a bizarre perception of the world. So I do vaguely remember that. (laughs) <laughs> and I do remember that there was sort of a look of shock in the room because it was a real mellow party. And we used to go to parties that used to be sort of sometimes out of hand. And um, so I think we left shortly after because we're just like, hey, I don't think they really want us here. <laughs> right. We weren't even there. We didn't even know anybody there. I don't yeah. know. I think you and I were just out just trying to find some party really drunk or high or something like that. Uh, uh, you know, go back to you saying how skinny you were back then, Nicole. Did I? T- there was, 
<laughs> Do you remember how much you could eat back then without gaining an ounce? I, I was telling I was telling Nicole about one time uh, we sent somebody off to get food when you and I were recording, and I, mean, I remember what you had gotten, which you ate and didn't think anything of, which was two Big Macs and two large fries, and you probably wanted to eat more. Yeah, well, Tara remembers when me and her first met. We used to go to um, go out for fast food, and I, I, it, I think what it actually was is that. Um, it was the early stages of my diabetes and I just uh, was feeling that insatiable hunger and I couldn't gain weight because I probably was already, um, dying. already high blood sugar and it just, it wasn't absorbing. So, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're still real thin. Yeah. I mean, but I, I, I'm probably a good 40 pounds heavier than what I used to be back then. I yeah, mean, I was like, I man. was like a skeleton. Yeah, you were. But that's what happens, I guess, too, when when it's beer for dinner. And I mean, there were a lot of days where I didn't even eat. Um, no, no, same here. I mean, you, yeah, you know, young, you feel invincible. You're just like, I'll just drink all day and do the other stuff and smoke all the time. What's going to happen? You know, uh, even though some bad things did happen. I mean, yeah, we you, you overdid it. I mean, I. A couple times I went way overboard, and I remember one time someone had to drag me home to my parents' house. Um, I was house sitting there, and I was just got so messed up. We went to um, was it Long Wongs, and with a couple guys I worked with, and I passed out in the street. I remember that. He piled <laughs> me up and took me home. Picked my parents up at the airport a couple days later, and like, what are all those scabs on your face? I was like, oh, I had an accident. I just fell. Well, I didn't tell him the whole story. But yeah, not not exactly my shining moments from the past, but makes for good stories now. Yeah, I remember when that happened. I think I was... I was living in that place behind Mrs. Rita's. You were. Because I remember thinking I should have just had them drive me over there. You should have just gone to my house. Yeah, but hey. You were right there. Long Longwons yeah. is like, what, 100 feet away from there. Yeah. So, Dad, um, you ever see that palm reader house in Tempe, Mrs. Rita's? I lived yeah, I in a house right behind Yeah, you. I remember you telling me about that. Oh, God, that was awful. Yeah. Well, I, I got that place behind, it's gross. Oh, yeah, there's two, like, well, I think they were like, um, like, Servants quarters oh, is what they originally were. It's terrible. Do you remember the cockroaches in there? I remember we'd come out of your apartment and there was a circle K that was that you could see coming out of your door. And I remember there would be yep. thousands of cockroaches on the back of that um, circle K wall. Uh, I know. Wasn't that just like phenomenally gross? Yes. People, I don't think people realize it that those things fly. But they don't like fly like a moth with, with, with no control. They, I mean, they have control of their flight. Yeah, like a bird. Those things are <laughs> disgusting. Those are those sewer roaches. They're disgusting. Yeah, I don't miss yeah. those things. Oh, yeah. God, it's awful. Yeah. Thank God I don't see those here. Well, you know, where I was living before I moved here, I didn't see them. But yeah, yeah old, old Town Tempe. Yeah, it's loaded with them. Probably not now. I mean, Old Town Tempe yeah, it's a completely different place, even yeah. after since you've left. Um, it's unrecognizable. There's skyscrapers there now. Um, all Tempe. along the town lake. Yeah, it's, 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 I haven't been down there in years, but, you know, you look at it when you drive by and it's, it's not the Tempe we remember. It's, um, uh, buildings all along the town lake um, it looks like a downtown yeah so i have some questions for you um let's talk about uh your caterwaul time um because that's pretty i think that's pretty interesting i mean you went and you got to go to japan and tour and yeah. and you were over there with them and you probably were a little bit on the inside of the la scene because caterwaul at the time were on um, irs records yeah um, and um i'm i'm i've always been sort of curious as to um 
why um, Catterwall never really makes any mention of the fact that you were in the band because you actually did a tour with them. I don't know. You have to ask them. I, I don't know. They, they don't, do they? Yeah, they don't. Um, I mean, from what I've seen, I don't. Yeah, um, uh, which is, I always felt was sort of um, unusual because, uh, I mean, you did play and um, and then you actually have a credit on one of their releases, don't you? They have, a, I don't know if you know this, but they released um, some of their demos. And when I was looking at the credits, um, you got a credit for a drum machine part. Really? Yeah, you should um, go to Discogs. What go, release? Go, over to, go to Discogs and look look them up. Um, I, it's um, a few years back, I think. I it might. I mean, I lose track of time, but they 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 released some demos from that period of time after they um, were dropped from IRS Records. And there is you know what I recorded. I did not to interrupt you. I did record in bass several songs with them in the studio uh, <clears throat> after they were um dropped from irs that yeah. you know they were recorded um some i want to say probably three to four songs with the intention of sending them out to other labels now there were there were labels contacting them yeah anyway um yeah, I, I I played bass on all those songs. Uh, obviously, Kevin played drums. Um, so I, I I don't recall a drum machine part. I I'm not saying I didn't. That was a long time ago. But yeah, you should definitely go check that out. Um, I think you would um, it'd be of interest of you to check that out. I mean, it's yeah, something you did. yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know anything about. Interesting it. stories from the tours or anything. What's that? Do you have any interesting stories or anything from like touring or any of that stuff with them? Um. Well, Japan was definitely a culture shock. Um. Did you guys ever? Did you, Did you guys ever go overseas? Did you with Lycia? No. Um, no. Well, we went to Mexico City. Um, we were flown down to Mexico City for a festival show. Oh, were you? Yeah. That besides cool. that, um, you know, it was just a, a real case of bad timing. Right around the time that we were getting all the offers for Europe and Asia, like um, like Hong Kong and stuff like that, is right when my health really was at a bad state. And we, we were offered to do um, the, a promoter in New York. Um, that put on our show wanted to do a Japanese tour with us, um, the Orb and Pop will eat itself, and they wanted us to be sort of like a, a a band that played after the other band because we were so mellow. And then after we were going to play, they were going to have the guy from the Orb was going to go out and do like a a chill down set afterwards. And be all great thing. But, you know, my health was bad, and um, but we. We still get offers for uh, Europe and South America on a real regular basis, but you know, it's just something we can't do. And I really am sad about it because I would have loved to have been able to go over and, 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 and you know, see the world. Um, yeah. You know, who knows after COVID? I mean, I think you, if you remember from last year, the Leipzig Festival, um, the big goth festival over there, they, Every yeah. year for the last 15 years, tell us that we have a standing offer to play at the Leipzig Opera House, and we have to turn it down every year. But last year it was really picking. Uh, two years ago it was really picking up steam. Um, the members of Soft Kill wanted to help us out and wa wanted us wanted to come and help us do um, the Cold album in its entirety um, because it's the, the album that. It really is the album that most people see as Lycia's biggest album. But, you know, it just, it's hard to do. And, you know, when you're juggling so many different things. So I, I don't think we'll ever get to be able to take advantage of that stuff. And so it's really cool it, that you were able to go over to Japan and experience Yeah, I feel lucky. 
about it. it but you're right it is hard it was hard on me in my 20s so. yeah and then you, you know, know with, like touring around the u.s i mean that that's yeah. hard enough you know half the time you don't know where you're at well you know. uh, i don't know how it was for you when you were t traveling with caterwall but when when lycia was touring not only was i um performing but i was also driving a lot and um I, yeah, I that really, really right there. Yeah, and I there were several occasions where my body just sort of broke down and I got sick because of lack of sleep. I, I think in one particular yeah. stretch, we we had a car, our car broke down in the panhandle of Florida. And so we got a rental car while the car was being worked on and went down and played shows in Fort Lauderdale and Tampa. Uh -huh. We also where I was also a witness at a wedding for a, a buddy of mine and we recorded a comp song. So we didn't get any sleep that night. So it was like several days without any sleep. And then we drove up to the panhandle, got the car and then drove to Atlanta for a show. By the time we got to Atlanta, my voice, I, my voice was gone. I hadn't slept for three days and your body really breaks down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember. Uh, that was when I was with Catterwall. That was a long tour because if, if you remember, I met up with him in, in New York and then we went down the southern route of the U.S. Jeez, you know, it takes two days just to get through that area yeah. of Texas. Yeah. Um, so we, we went down that and then into California did shows. Then we went over in, we went over to Vancouver, then came back, did shows in California again. And then into to Japan and then back doing more shows in California. I'm like, good God, when is this over? How long were you in Japan? Huh? How long were you in Japan for? It was like, Two weeks, I think it was. Wow. Yeah. Um, we, I think it was that long, something like that, a week and a half, two weeks. Um, we did a bunch of shows there, but you know how it is. You play day off, play day, day off. Yeah. So, played in Tokyo, and then we played a bunch of shows, you know, like, Osaka and Nagoya. I don't remember all of them. I have a hard time remembering. And uh, it was interesting. I, you know, it's sad. And you, you guys know how it is. Is you could be somewhere. You could be somewhere hey, that you want, you really want to see, but, to, but you know when you're on tour, but you can't you can't see it. Yeah. Yep. You see uh, the inside of the club, and that's about it. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, so think about it. what did I really see. I mean, I saw, I saw the landscape of Japan on the bullet train from like Tokyo to wherever, but that that doesn't do it justice. Yeah, no. yeah, we can relate to that. I mean, we were like what five blocks from the French Quarter in New Orleans, and um, we never saw anything. We were just in this club that had a barbed wire fence around it because it was a dangerous neighborhood. And we pulled up, pulled our car in there, sat in this dirty club with cockroaches and rats, and you never, know, got never, got to, never got to see any of it. You know, you just drive through, you're so close, but you know, you never see any of it. Um, I've seen it. Yeah. It's it, New Orleans is. And, and the French Quarter, it's, you'd like it. It's cool. Yeah, well, I think we're going to, th yeah, we're, there's a good chance that we're going to be going there um, based on Tara's writing and um, doing a meet and greet thing. And um, if everything, cool. if it's post COVID, then we'll probably, um, I'll probably bring my guitar and we'll sit out in the courtyard and do a, just a unaffected acoustic show, like what we're doing in our, um, these live from home things. Um, which yeah, that, seemed a lot, a lot easier and more fun because you don't have to stage everything. You just sit down and play. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. I, mm -hmm. I think where Nicole and I are thinking about probably going next 
<coughs> is, uh, you know, Salem and some other parts of Massachusetts. We have some friends in Salem, so. Yeah. Um, and I haven't been to Massachusetts. I really want to see it. It's pretty. Yeah. I bet, you know, I, I was telling Mike, you know, I think during the early stages of this whole thing that I just felt like I wanted to get out of here and visit like some New England states that I had never been to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, New, New England's cool. I mean, it's, it's a different vibe altogether. Once you leave New York and you get up in New England, it just feels very different. Um, it's like old and haunted feeling. Yeah. I mean, we, that's, that's what we really want to see. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's like a, you know, Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we were we were there. I mean, we we played a show in Poughkeepsie, um, and it's right up in the Hudson Valley, and, and we we yeah. played there in um, just before Halloween, and mm -hmm. the oh, leaves were all full, and we were like driving through there, saying, "Oh my gosh, this is this is Sleepy Hollow. It literally is the place that Washington Irving, you know, wrote." So yeah, yeah that, it's New, New York, yeah. Yeah, but, it's very yeah, cool. That whole, you know, like Tara was saying, that, you know, the whole spooky vibe. Very, you can oh, definitely feel it. And then, it you know, the it, yeah. orange. Yeah. Rhode Island was really beautiful, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I bet. Rhode Maine. Mm -hmm. um, New Hampshire, you know, any of those places, but yeah, I think, you know, the last, the last place, I don't know if I told you, I'm sure I did the last place that we were at, which was last year was in Florida. We were in Orlando. It's like, good God, get me out of here. It was just, yeah. I, I, I can't, I can't stand that heat and that. Florida's um difficult. I've never really meshed with Florida myself. Um, when we toured um, in '95, we were down there, and it was hot as can be. It's terrible. It was just miserable. It is. It's miserable. But you know, the humidity is just awful. It's um, it's overwhelming. And we were there. We were complaining about the heat, and there you know, people are like you. You, aren't you from Arizona? Like, yeah, it's not the same. I'm not going to say the the thing that everyone says, but I mean, it, it does make a difference. The dry heat it does. does, make a difference. It does. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. So I wanted to tell you guys. Um, a little while ago, I got a notification that they played the our friends Electric. Uh, they're starting to play that on some playlists, some clubs. And oh, yeah. they got put on our entries. Uh, you turned into a robot. Today. Yeah, you turned into a robot again. <laughs> I'm, I'm electric. Yeah. <laughs> You're the electric friend? Oh, so dear, I've known you for you years. You can come up with something better than that. I've known you for years. You can come up with something dumber than that. <laughs> come on. I don't know. <laughs> yeah i i see i've seen that that song has um um done pretty it's 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 gotten a lot of listens and um i think in the last week i've gotten notifications that's been played maybe five six times on um, either virtual clubs or on you know just different playlists and stuff and i i so far um i i haven't seen anything negative at all everyone really likes it um, so it was, that was a fun song to do. Um, I wasn't, I, I, I'm generally not a cover type of guy, but, um, me either. You I, know that. I definitely enjoyed doing that song. It was a, it was a bit of a challenge, um, because, uh, Gary it was Newman, fun, wasn't it? It was fun. He's a very different type of writer, but I tell you one thing is after really delving into the lyrics and stuff, I really, I think that there's a, a similar aesthetic um, that I can really relate to. I really dug the whole um, experience of doing that. And I, 
Um, I've been and really enjoying working on the, um, so I'm not going to name the song that I'm finishing up right now, but it's an old song that John and I worked originally on in 1989. And, and um, just so you know, John, I finished the mix today. I did some final tweaks and it um, sounds really good. So um, great. Uh, I'm, you know, what you've done so far, I mean, just, just the very early stages of it sounded really good to me. You know, it's not it's not like when we worked back together in 89, where we would just throw out music. I, I'm such a different type of musician now that I lit, I literally listen to every little nuance. And if it's not 100 percent the way I want it, I'll go back and remix it. And so I'll listen to the mixes oh, and I'll take all these notes and I'll go back and I'll fine tune. And the fine tunes are so minimal, but it's so important to me to get it right. So it, it, it leads to a much slower um, working process, but I think in the end, like I think in Flickr is a perfect example. I mean, I think that's, that is without a doubt my favorite Lycia album. Um, it's everything that I wanted a Lycia album to be. And along the ways, every album sort of had some little detour that would take it a little bit off from my vision but within Flickr's, just going with it and spending the extra time really was worth it because, and I think, I think it shows. I, 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 I think it's gonna. Uh, I mean, the fact that a failure has done so well, um, it gets about twelve thousand plays a month on Spotify. Yeah, I never um, thought that would happen. It just goes and goes and goes, and it. And I can honestly say that A Failure is Lycia's most popular song ever. Um, That's funny. I see you, you that, know what's funny about the whole thing is like, when I was writing that stuff, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to send this over to Mike. See what he thinks. But I honestly thought you'd be, nah, nah. Well, well I, I enjoyed working on it because, um, you know, I, I work in different ways with different people. And when I work with you, it brings out a style of my playing that only comes out when I work with you. And so it was a real blast from the past when I started working on that and this for a failure because it literally transported me back to the late eighties when I was working on it. And even though stylistically it was quite a bit different, it still felt the same. And so it was really cool um, working on it. And that's why I'm excited that we're working on new stuff now. Mm -hmm. I know I am too. Well, you know, um, when, you, when you were mentioning there that, you know, the way you're working has changed. Uh, yeah, it's same with me. I, I think I'm more picky about stuff because, you know, since we started working on some things and I told you I would like send you some other stuff. There's like a zillion things that I've started and I'm like, hey, I'll send this to them and then I'll listen to it the next day. And I'm like, God, I'm glad I didn't send that. You know, I'm just being really picky about it. Yeah, and that's actually, well, first of all, you're probably being overly picky. I, I feel fairly convinced because everything you've sent me has sounded good. But it's probably good because uh, as much as I would love to go full force and try to get an album out, it's going to be, it's going to be a test for me just to get six songs done for an EP this summer. And that's what I'm shooting for. As right. of now, we got three songs, and I know that there's there's at least one, but maybe two, two more um, guitar songs that I've been working on that I'd probably have you do drums on. Cool. Like the other ones, and then I'd like to do another synth song. But um, you know, I like to keep I like to keep things open. You know, if if those songs um, develop quicker than I planned, then you know I might ask you for another song or two. You know, and if it keeps on going, I might, you know, maybe, maybe reach out to Dave and see if we can do sort, sort of, a, of a replication of and flickers with, you know, a bunch of different styles and me trying to just meld it into some cohesive final product. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not like I used to be where I'm trying to think big picture. I, I, I feel like just function. Like right now I'm working on that, the song that I mentioned earlier. And when I feel good with that, when it's done, then I'll just start another song and see where it goes. Cause I can get derailed real easily, you know, with the distractions of life will take you over and then you can't get back to music for two weeks. And 
Right. Uh, not like back in 89 where every single day it was like, okay, I'm home from work. Uh, uh, John's going to show up. We're going to work on music for like five hours and he's going to go home. And then I'm going to work for like four more hours. And then I'm going to sleep for an hour and go to work and come back and, sleep and do it again. That's the same. How, um, how's Dave been? <laughs> Yeah, he's going to be, we're going to be doing this thing with Dave next week and he's doing good. Um, he, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Dave and I are a lot alike in that we get, um, we have this love hate relationship with music where we both over the last maybe 15 years go through these stages where we're like, I'm done. I'm spent. I have nothing more to say. I don't know if I can do anything else that is even worthy of anything. And so you walk away and then you come back a short time later. And so he's, he's sort of in that stage now where he's sort of recharging a little bit. Um, yeah. Where's he living now? He lives up in Northern Wisconsin at the, um, it's actually oh, yeah? the, closest, the closest city is probably Iron Mountain, Michigan. And yeah. he hasn't, he's out in, out in the, in the wild of, of Northern Wisconsin. And it's probably out he's in the snow right now. But he is? He's in a log cabin. How did he end up there? He he um, well when we when we moved to Ohio, Dave went with us um because he was uh, you know we, it was in the nineties and it was the peak of Lycia and that era of Lycia. Yeah. And um, then he moved back here, and then he came back to Ohio just before we moved back here, and he he um. Uh, he met a woman up there. She actually lived with us for a while in our apartment, our shared apartment with Dave in Ohio. And he's married, they've been married for a long time. And she got a job up in um, Iron Mountain. So they moved up there and he, he likes it up there. It's, um, it's beautiful up there. Um, so I'm yeah, it's, he has a big, he has a massive, um, massive yard out in the, it's out in the country and the, a nice house and it's, it's it's really nice it looks like a really good place and but um dave and i communicate on a real regular basis and like i i've talked to him and i said you know john and i've been working on some stuff this doesn't mean that you're excluded from lycia it just means you know john and i are working on stuff and he's totally cool with the whole idea so um i think he's getting ready to come back to music though he just posted yeah yeah he's he's okay. doing some stuff um, him, him and Tara might be doing a cover song here shortly. And I, I approach Dave because Tara's into more aggressive music, probably more so than I am. Um, so she really wants to do a couple heavier songs. And so we approached, um, Dave about maybe um, doing a couple heavier songs, but, um, you know, at this stage of my life, I'm not pushing anything at this point when people want to work they can work and there's going to be times where i lay low i'm just glad that i've reconnected um with the people that i've worked best with over the years um you know everyone that has been a, a, a official member of lycia I'm, I'm working with except for will the the great enigma but i know that will pretty much i don't know where he's at i no one knows where will's at um I've had other people contact me asking if I knew where he was at. People that were friends of his. Um, Somebody's contacted you? Yeah, I've had several people contact me. He said, you know how to get a hold of Will, but really? uh, I, he's just dropped off the radar. I don't know what's going on with him, but I, you know, me and Will had a, a pretty good working relationship for a very short time, a very short time. But when it was working, it was working. And you know, I wouldn't mind touching base with him again, but I do know that he never really had anything positive to say about Lycia. Um, he was always a naysayer. He he was critical of, of, of Lycia quite often. In fact, the last time I saw him, um, we were living in Ohio still and we were on tour and we did a stop here in Scottsdale at a place, I think it was called the Atomic Cafe. It was in 97. I remember that and place. He he showed up to the show and I went up to talk to him and he was really It's a complete dick. He was really quiet and really? <laughs> evasive to me. 
and really negative. And then when we were on stage, we were literally in the second song or third song and I could see him out there and he just literally just walked out the door. He <laughs> That's Will. And, I, and I'm pretty sure he, he wanted me to see it. He, I think he was there to, to what Tara? He completely did that on purpose. He wanted you to see him be like, fuck you and walk off. That's what he wanted. Yeah, that's what the impression I got. And I've never, um, I've never had any kind of communication with him since. And, um, you know, I, yeah. I tried, I, he was I tried. Pretty, he was pretty bitter about, you know, cause you know, I hung out with him a lot when yeah. I was in college. Yeah. And last time I saw him, what, what, what year was that? That, that, you, that was 97. You know what? That's probably around 97, 98. It was probably around the last time I saw him. You know, he was living near me <clears throat> around, yeah. you know, during that time I was living there in 13th and Farmer. Yeah. And he was over there all the time, hanging out with me in that house that I lived in. Yeah. And then, and then he started going to Arizona State. And then... Then one day he was gone. Yeah. He just disappeared. I don't know what happened to him. But I know he was, yeah, he was pretty bitter about he, life. He, yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, he, you know, I don't want, I, I've really made a decision in my life about five years ago where I was going to let bygones be bygones. And it led to me and you being buddies again. And it led me going back to project. And, you know, you, you can't hold on to that stuff. You can't hold, you got to like see the big picture, but. So with that into account, you know, he, he really, he really let me down. Um, we were recording the first album. See what happened was it as timing always goes with me. Everything is always off. No, nothing ever lines up properly. You know, me and you were trying our hardest to get on project and project was not unable to sign us. And lo and behold, you go off and tour with Caterwall and Project offers me a deal and says, yeah, I'd love to do something, but we got to move with it now. So you were gone. I had no idea when you were going to come back because you're on tour. So I, I approached Will and said, look, here's the deal. Project Record wants to do an album. Hey, I want to do some of these songs I did with John. Are you willing to come on board and learn the parts? He said yes, but as soon as we started working on the stuff, he was like, I don't want to do that. I want to do my own music. And then it just sort of spun out of control until the wheel was completely reinvented. And he was almost sort of calling the shots with what we were doing. And we tried recording an album and, it, and we had like maybe two or three good songs and a lot of things that I didn't feel were, were working very well. And we were living together at the time with him me him and his girlfriend and i said look this is just not working for me and um we need to re-envision this and he just went awol i mean i was living with the guy we have a record deal on waiting for us we've we passed the deadline that project gave us and and he just i said we need to re-record some songs and he just was gone and we I would ask his girlfriend, is he coming home tonight? We need to work on music. Oh, he's out with his friend skating. He said he'll be back in a little bit. And I waited. Who the hell waited. gets a record deal and then just doesn't and it wasn't, do anything? And the thing is, That's is that so the, record, dumb. the record deal wasn't his record deal. It was mine and your record deal. We're the that's the demo. Right, but I, I mean, he he was involved in it. He so knew that. So you know, he, he, he's not a dumb person. Yeah, I, I mean, personally who, think who does that? He he was pissed off that the sessions weren't going the way that he wanted them to go, and well, then fix the shit. What the hell? Yeah, and going that's what it was. And getting stoned isn't gonna yeah, it, and so isn't gonna accomplish anything. So the solution that I proposed to him was, okay, look, we need to re envision this, and we need to do it, and we need to do it now. And he blew me off. And so I'd get home from work and I, I really committed myself to it because I was working 
like 11 hour days outside and I'd get home and I was shot. So I cut back smoking almost to nothing. I stopped drinking so that I could have energy to work on music and I'd get home and I'd wait and he wouldn't be there. So I just started working on, I well, I'm like, okay, I'll work on this song by myself. And one thing led to another and um, pretty soon I had uh, an album's worth of material and he's still blowing me up. I didn't, I don't think I seen him for like over a month and I lived in the same house as him. And then one day, um, God. this was over, you probably know the area off of Spence over by ASU. Just yeah, you know what's funny is I was telling Nicole about that. That, that area's a shithole. It is. And we lived in a house that was so beat up that when we moved in, we had the gas people come over to turn the gas on. And the guy was like, I'm not going to do it. Your house is going to explode. So we, lived there. <laughs> we lived there for nine months with no gas. So there was no hot water for like the whole time I lived there. Every day was a ice cold shower. But anyways, I overheard the house had like the, there, there were like cracks in the wall that you could hear through. And one day I was in my room and I could hear him and his girlfriend talking and they were like, let's just move out. Let's just move out. And I remember hearing his girlfriend say, well, well, we should tell Mike. And I heard him say, fuck that. Let's just move out. Who cares? So I literally, I literally went out the next day and got an apartment and then came back that night and said, I'm moving out. They were so fucking pissed at me. How funny. And so I went to my apartment. I moved over into West Mesa over by MCC. And um, Project was going to drop me because they had. Uh, really? Yeah. What happened was this. <clears throat> um, shortly after you left to join Cadwell, they offered the deal and they wanted to have the album um, by the end of the year. Um, I, it was not going the way that I wanted. So, um, I got, I, I got it so that like April, middle of April or something was going to be the deadline. Well, I didn't, I didn't get him final tapes until the end of June because of how everything was going really bad with the, the sessions. And Sam was so frustrated with my nonstop delays that he was going to just say, he actually said, I don't know if I'm going to release this anymore. And I think it was because his girlfriend, Susan, liked the, dem the demos that I sent that he finally gave it a good listen. And I remember he said that he laid on the floor and with the speakers on both sides and the album finally clicked for him. And so it salvaged the deal, but I really felt like, man, I spent a decade of my life trying to get this record deal. I finally have it. It's going to, it's going away. Um, because I was dependent on you and I was dependent on Will after you left because I needed somebody to do the drums and the bass. I, I didn't, I, I never did that stuff. And so when the deal, the deal was almost gone, uh, I had to do it by myself. And I remember after I lived in Mesa, one day just, out of the blue. I don't know how he found where I live, but he just knocked on my door. And he walked in and he was like, all right, I'm ready to start the album again. And I reached over and Will? I handed him, I, yeah, I handed him the Ionia CD. I'm like, it's done and it's released already. And he just looked at me like I was some kind of traitor. And that was the, that's the, that's the, the source of his bitterness because I think he thinks I stole his record deal from him. When did, how, when did he when, do that? This was, how, um, how later? It was probably, he went AWOL about April. I moved yeah. out in June or end of May. I moved out in the end of May and I mixed it. I, I spent the, the month of June piecing things together and I mixed the album with Sam in July and it was released in September. So this was probably about October. So I hadn't seen him in person probably since May and when I moved out. And he shows up and he says he's ready to work on that. Yeah, he thought he thought that when he said that well, he 
I think he was under the impression that he needed a break and that we weren't going to rever- we weren't going to continue with the album until he was ready to work on it. He needed and, a break from what? <laughs> I don't know. But the look on his face when I handed him the Ionia album, I could see at that point, the best description I could have was, was I saw his face was, was hate. It oh. looked like he hated me. And from that point on, we never had a good relationship. And But he still would come around and hang out now and then. And when I started on the next album, A Day in the Stark Corner, I had um, maybe half the album done. And I said, why don't you come on board and we'll do some some stuff. You can maybe play some bass. And, and he was receptive to the idea at that point. But then I went and I, to California and I mixed it with Sam. And he was going to be on like two songs. And... When I got back, he came over to my house and he's like, I've changed my mind. I don't want to be on the album. I was like, what do you mean? It's already mixed. Oh, I don't want to be on it. Why? I don't want to be associated with Lycia. It's you don't dog. want to be associated with Lycia. Okay. But the album's mixed already. Well, I don't want to be involved. Well, as it turned out, there was a problem with the mix. And Sam called me about a month later and said, we need to remix. So I said, screw you, Will, man. You're out. And I... When, and I, I normally I try to save masters like all yeah. our old demos, our, all our old demo, demos, you know, I saved them. They're important to me. But with that, I was like, right. he's not interested. I recorded over his parts and recorded synth to replace his parts. And um, the irony, the absolute irony of it all is that at that very time, he told me that he didn't want to be associated with Lycia because Lycia wasn't wasn't the kind of music that represented him and that he wanted to be in something more something more along the lines of God flesh. Now what's interesting about the story I like God flesh is around the same time from what we've been told. I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure of this, but we've been told by a number of people that Justin Broderick of God flesh at the same time was listening to Lycia. Like- and uh, Peter Steele of Typo Negative who was a big? Oh, oh I know they. I know he he toured with Godflesh, and oh, yeah. that tour, that tour was Godflesh, Typo Negative, and Pantera, and they all were listening to Lycia. Now I think it's sort of ironic that Will is being all like, "I don't want to be associated with your little stupid, moody, timid band or whatever he perceived it as." Meanwhile, the people that he saw as his heroes were listening to Lycia. Karma is, yeah. It, it, karma i'll just say that but you know even despite all that you know i um when i was in ohio i remember reaching out to you to see if i could get a hold of will because uh, you know i wanted to include a couple of songs that i did with will on a compilation album and um i just never got a hold of him so i just went ahead and did it i'm sure he's probably bitter about that but, was that during uh, a time when i was still talking to him yeah it was it was like it was shortly after that tour. Oh, okay. Yeah, Project approached me about um, doing a comp album that was sort of like celebrate their hundredth release. He just yeah. disappeared, you know. I just one day went to call him, <clears throat> and he was. It, it, it's like he never existed. He, when I, I lived with him for maybe uh, six months before I moved into that little, um, well, I call it the Lycia apartment because that's where Lycia was sort of born. But before that, we lived in another apartment in that same complex um, after things fell out with Brian. And then I lived with him and his girlfriend for like nine months at that house but when i lived in that apartment will regularly came by as you remember yeah he was sort of um i i I wouldn't call him a member of what we were doing but he was almost like a a studio engineer for some of the stuff that we did like for the wake album the wake ep he was there we used a lot of his equipment and he helped when we were recording it and that's why i gave him on the original cassette, I gave him some credits um, for effects, but right. 
Um, he, he was always anti everything, um, anti government, anti, I mean, he was just, he, back then he would talk about, you know, barcodes on us and the government's watching you and he doesn't want to be connected to anything. And he was real paranoid about that stuff. And I always just assumed that it, that's just, that just eventually consumed him and he just dropped completely off the grid. Um, which is a shame because Will actually, when, when things were, were, when he had some clarity, he was a pretty talented guy musically, but um, yeah, he my was. Yeah. My experience with Will was, when he joined Laura's Toy, me and him wrote like four great songs immediately. And that's why Brian became so bitter. But then after that, nothing just disappeared. Nothing ever happened after that. We moved into that apartment in Tempe. And under the premise that we were going to have something new going on and nothing ever happened. Um, and then when um, he joined up with Lycia, we did two really good songs with Byzantine and x and then nothing. And that was one of the reasons why those sessions just stopped because we wanted, we wanted to have some kind of uniform sound for the first album, but we wrote two songs and it was done. And it was like, okay, what do we do now? You know, he, was, he was like that way with everything. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't just music, like, I was living in this before the place I was living in uh, when I was in college, the place I was living in before I moved over there in 13th and Farmer, which I don't, I don't know if you remember, but I remember that was Yusuf's old, old place. I didn't know it was Yusuf's place, but I do remember it was right across the street from the old hell house um, where, yeah, 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 where I used to practice with Mr. 300. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then, yeah. And down the street from there, Michael Cornelius from JFA. Yeah. Me and Michael went down to his house one time to borrow microphones and this was 300 today. So I remember it was like oh, yeah. four houses down. Yeah. Well, anyway, the place I li lived in before there, Will would come by and that was in the early days. Uh, Cause that, you know, that was the, that was still the early 90s. Yeah. Um, and I had gotten, for the time, a high-end Mac and got a hold of Photoshop and, and some other stuff, which was, you know, back then was like a freaking big deal to have stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> and, and and I was doing, he saw this like weird manipulating of stuff I was doing to images and Photoshop. And he was like, hey, let's make a fake tabloid. <laughs> I remember and, you telling me about that. Yeah, it was hilarious. And and then I, you know, I had some desktop publishing software too. So I was like, all right, man, you know, I, I have all this stuff. We could do it. You know, he shows up and we start doing that. And then and, and the point I'm trying to make here is that then he disappears for a long time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and then he shows up, you know, a long time later. And like Hey, yeah, I'm still willing to work on that. And then I show him all this stuff that I've done. You know, the same as you. Exact same thing. You know, because you can't sit. Well, I'm not going to sit around and wait for him to help. I'm just going to do it myself, right? I mean, because yeah. you and I are both capable of doing all this shit ourselves. So we just right. do it. Because you can't rely on anybody else. Well, especially not him. But you know what? At that point, I had already learned I couldn't rely on him because of the crap with Lycia. Yeah. So, yeah, so he gets mad to at me about that. Yeah. Hey, man, it's his loss because, um, I mean, bringing things up to the present, you know, I, like I said, I was settling all my, all the things that I were weird for me for years and I made up with all my old friends, except for him. And, um, I mean, you talk about Dave and I had major beefs when we lived in Ohio. We're buds now, you know, we're friends again. Um, 
I I would have been more than receptive to have him play on one song on In Flickers, but you know he he would never he would never want to be involved, and it's his loss because you know things are going really good for the band right now, and um, I'm really happy with where we're going right now. I feel probably as comfortable with the band now as I ever have felt, and I'm really thankful that both you and Dave are really are along for this great ride. And of course, Tara too, because she went, you know, she's always, she's been involved since 94. So, so. um, yeah. World. Yeah. But yeah, man, I, I'm glad you're back on board. Um, it's fun working with you again. And, um, if, if, if you ever, if you ever get it in your, your, um, I'm always, I'll just put it out right here. And if you're ever open to like maybe redoing some of those guitar bass songs, man, I'm, I'm completely open. I understand time. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I would love to. I mean, I, I listened to some of those early songs and especially considering what we've done to the song, the synth song that we've just redone. It, it's, it sounds new and updated, but it, 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 it retains the spirit of 89, a hundred percent. And I, I still, I still firmly believe that there is a great lost Lycia release, which is that early demos. And if we would have recorded those to the same quality as the stuff that I recorded in the '90s and Dave and I recorded in the '90s, I really, truly believe that that early stuff would be regarded as some of Lycia's best. I, 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 I really do. I can hear through the noise of those demos and I can hear those songs and I know what they, I know what they would have sounded like if we would have recorded them right. Um, yeah. Considering the way things went in the nineties with the bands, I think we were a bit ahead of our time. And if we would have recorded it right, who knows what could have happened, but you know, that damn beer and cigarettes <laughs> and our ambitions of like, writing 10 billion songs i mean you remember well we'd write a song and say oh we'll, we'll, we'll re-record that later let's go on to the next one yeah i was telling the cool that we literally had hefty bags full of tapes uh and i was just telling tara because i needed to find the lyrics for the song that we're working this mystery song that we're working on and i was looking through an old note some old notebooks of lyrics that i have and there are a lot of songs that there are lyrics for that we don't have any tapes for and i could still remember the singing melodies and i'm like oh my god that was a great song i haven't heard it since probably 89 because the tapes are gone you right know, tapes disappear which is funny because let's talk about wake because this is this is interesting <clears throat> what sort of got me going to re to releasing all the old demos and what led to me doing the cassette with wake and having it remastered and having in mean, circle social was like very cool about doing the vinyl version of it it was someone made a post and i don't know how this happened tara remembers this someone had one of our original demos one of the ones that we made back in Tempe where we just hand duped them to send to labels, the ones where we took those huh? pictures that uh, from that mythology book, someone yeah. had that demo and they took a picture of it. Really? And they, want, they wanted to know if it was authentic. And I was like, that is authentic. When and it is. How it was, it was this was just be, maybe a year before we reissued Wake. Um, on on cassette, so this this person had an original Lycia demo from 1988 or 89, early 89, and that was really for me the catalyst to, how they to get go that? back. I don't know how they got it. It there wasn't a person in Arizona. It was a person back on the East Coast. They had a copy of that demo. Oh, and I. See somebody in arizona no nope, it was someone that's, on East Coast. that's a long way to travel well they bought it someone they bought it on ebay or something 
Ooh. And um, that was really the catalyst for me to um, revisit that era. And um, going through all those old songs and preparing them for the SoundCloud page and then doing Wake, it was just like, you know, that, that, that era, when I think of Lycia's best eras, I, I look at that late 88 to maybe spring of 89 as, as one of those that go right along with maybe the cold era and maybe the era of a line that, you know, quiet moments, a line that connects and then flickers. I mean, I really think that, you know, we've been doing music for so long and there are periods that are good and there are periods that are not so good. I, I consider that early day a good time. I think for me, one of the worst times for me was the empty space time. And it more had to do with the fact that I was really struggling with my health and yeah, you were really sick during that I time. I was so sick, and I abandoned the album because I just couldn't finish it. And I can't even listen to that. I mean, eventually we put it out, but I can't even listen to it because it just screams bad memories to me. But the early demos are awesome. And um, so the invitation is out there. If you ever want to just get a bass and start and there's a million stuff. times that, since i've been living here that nicole's like come on let's go get you a bass i'm like all right i'm into it. but you know what I, I end up not coming home with one but i i will get one um the, the thing is i is almost that... had one in august yeah yeah but they didn't have it was an ibanez micro bass so i wanted it. and i saw one at, at guitar center one time and it was cool because it was you know, I like smaller bases. You know, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not into bases that are like the size of a P bass or something like that. And this yeah. thing was really small. It was nice. And we went there, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we're out of those." I'm well, like, uh. well, let me tell you, man, I'm a big Ibanez fan. Um, I've been playing Ibanez. Oh, I, I still play Ibanez. My acoustic guitar is an Ibanez. My electric guitar is an Ibanez, and. I'm sold on the thin necks of the Ibanez. And um, hey, man, if you want to get a bass and we want to revisit a handful of those old songs, I'm telling you right now, there would be a shitload of interest in it. Um, there's yeah, a whole I, 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 I'd really love to. And I, I really want one of those. You know, what's funny is if, if you remember, you and I ran up to uh, some music store. I don't remember where it was it, 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 when I before I went off with Catawall to get a new bass, and I picked up a Fender Squire because they were dirt cheap. Yeah, those goddamn things are like four or five hundred bucks now. Yeah, um, but that 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 damn Ivan it was, was only like a couple hundred bucks, and it was great. It had great action on it. It was small, really small. So I I really want one of those. Um. Yeah, I'm sold on Ibanez. Um, I have an Ibanez classical acoustic guitar, which is what I've been using for the new material. And that was a very affordable guitar and it stays in tune. And um, I absolutely love playing it. Um, Tara bought me a Ibanez electric guitar in 2000. Tara, was it with 2008? 2008, that was when you did the um, Illy Affair, wasn't it, Tara? uh 2009 i think was it 2009 i think so okay oh, you were using an imanez and i still have that old you know, when, when you and i lived together in in the late 80s i still have that it's just sitting in a case over here yeah the old purple imanez i still have it it, it um yep. i took it on the first couple of lycia tours and um then i replaced it with an epiphone les paul which um oh yeah i liked i liked it but um when tara bought me this new ivan is electric i was just like i'm an ivan is guy that guitar with that thin neck um it's just it's just so made for the way i play so ivan is you want a lycia endorsement you got two guys right here saying it you know uh you yeah, can I'm endorse us um we're more than 
happy to be, we'll do an ad for you for a guitar player. We'll stand there and have the dumb look on our face like we're rocking out. Um, <laughs> sponsor us. So stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, do miss, I do miss this with 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 Caterwall. I didn't have to pay any for pay, pay for any bass strings. I, I don't know where this was coming from, but I was getting these boxes of Ernie Ball strings all the time while I was on tour. And I yeah. don't know. Oh, they were finding us. They were like showing, here's your, here's your strings. They must have arranged some kind of endorsement deal. So that's, uh, Lycia has been offered endorsement deals before, but it, um, in the mid 2000s, I forgot the name of the company. It, uh, it was, at the time, it was an upstart um, company for um, software recording and stuff. And they had just at the time USB interfaces and the guy contacted me and I can't remember what it was. And I was like, it sounds interesting. And he's like, I can hook you up if you want. I can send you this and this and this for free. But being the, the, the dumbass and that I usually am, when something really good is staring me in the face, I somehow, somehow derail it all the time. And now that company is really big. And What happened? What would you I'm, do? I'm, dumb, I'm a dumbass. I mean, I just was like, I mean... The 2000s was a real down musical decade for me because, you know, the way things um, sort of fizzled out for us in the 90s, when the the, um, the music scene sort of went from atmospheric music to more dance oriented music, Lycia became has been's really quick, and all our records were taken from the, the stores, and we no one really seemed to care about us anymore. And it really messed with my head at the same time that my health was going bad. So when we moved to Arizona, I was just checked out and, and I really didn't do anything musically for quite a number of years. And that is when it happened around the same time we were, I was also asked to score a movie and oh, really? um, I told them no. And the movie actually ended up coming out with a professional person scoring it. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I would have, I mean, that's not what I do, though I probably would have struggled it anyways. I mean, someone says, okay, write the happy song for the love scene. What? I just write yeah, that's kind of hard. Yeah, so it wouldn't have been a good fit for me, but opportunities were there in the 2000s and I just, I just checked out. I just, I didn't, I didn't partake in anything. And it wasn't until that show that I was, um, that I was just talking about where Tara bought me that guitar. Back to that story was in that period of time where I was pretty in, inactive, Tara was doing solo music and, and, and she was writing her books, the initial stage of her writing her books. And so she was actually more of the active creative person than much more so than I was. And um, I wasn't going to do anything. I was done with music and she was going over to California to play the show to um, promote her book. And it was really quite a, 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 a all-star lineup because um, on the bill for that night that these other females sing, it was called Illy Affair. And it was sort of like an all-star LA lineup of um, people. Eva O from Christian Death and Shadow Project played. Um, Jarbo of Swans played. Uh, Monica of Faith in the Muse played. Um, Phil, our friend Phil played. Um, Veronica of the band Sorrow played. Who else played Tara? Was that it? And uh, that's and, it. Yeah, and then Tara played. And cool. Uh, Tara went into the solo show, but um, I was helping her with sound. Reluctant, I was very reluctantly helping her with sound because I was so burnt out with music. And we, I don't know how we, how did we come to the conclusion, Tara, that I was going to maybe come up and play a couple songs with you? You, uh, I don't know, just screwing around, I think. And you're, it just was kind of like, you may as well do it. Cause you, you know, you, you are always have the mindset of if you can just play guitar, that would be cool. Yeah. And I think, I think we used to sort of practice around where you would just play stuff on the guitar and I would sing to it. And so it just kind of sort of accidentally happened so to so to encourage me to play she bought me this guitar it's the nicest nicest guitar i ever had and so i went and played it and 
it didn't seem like there was any pressure on me because it felt like Lycia was so has been that I didn't have anything to to prove anymore. And I went out and played the show and it was I and I made a I made a shitload of mistakes too if I remember right. But it was just so much fun and it really spurred this second life of Lycia. That was that was the beginning and you know we've been just working since and so now I'm trying to keep all my options open. Um, though to anyone that watches this don't feel bad when you ask me to play a part on your album or or to mix your album or do anything i i really am at this point in my life just concerned with working with the people that i've already established relationships with um i i have no desire really to start anything new so it's really just the four of us, as far as I'm concerned, the, the only things I really want to work on. And it, um, I get offers every once in a while to, you know, mix an album. It's nothing personal. You know, I just limited well, on my time. I don't want to spend my creative time working with people that I have history with because, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. If you want to do it well, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just mind blowing. We met each other in 82 so that's a long time and so sure. we understand we understand how each other work i mean that that 88 89 period when we just hammered out music i mean we did a lot of stuff then and there you know when you work in that intensely on stuff there's just this understanding of how each other worked i i i understand where you're coming from when you send me a song it makes sense to me and you know, vice versa. And I understand where Dave comes from, but I'm not looking to start anything new, but uh, definitely, definitely be interested in maybe doing a couple of his old songs, maybe. So well, think about yeah, that. That gives me the incentive to look at one of those bases then. Cause you know, like I said, for the past, I don't know, four years, Nicole's like, Oh, come on, I'll get, let's go get a bass. You want a bass? You know you want a bass. I'm like, yeah, I do, but, you know, then what am I going to do with it? Um, so, like I said, you know, like, she almost got me one in August. Yeah. But it just, well, they didn't have one, so. Nicole, get him a bass. Tara got, Tara got me a guitar, got me going again, so maybe you get him a bass, we'll get him going again. Trying and trying and trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna get him one for Christmas, and he said, "No, no, no." And he yeah. wanted something else. So. Yeah, you know, you know what she got me for Christmas? Well, one of the things she got me. You'll appreciate this, Mike. I Tara won't remember this. Um, you remember Wallace and Ladmo? Yes. She got me a a book about the history of the show. Yeah. Yeah, oh, really? yeah. They, I, I, they had published this book. I had I had seen it in the '90s, and I brought it up to her. I'm like, <laughs> you know, this. I don't know. Maybe there was something on YouTube that I saw about Wallace and Lamb or something. You know, to to explain to her what this whole thing was. And then, I don't know. She somehow hunted down this book that's like long been out of print. That's cool. Very beautiful. I know. Oh yeah, she. Oh yeah, I got. Uh, she got me a, a new set of those Sennheisers, those headphones. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, those things, those damn things are not cheap. No, and you need good headphones. I don't know about you, but um, I actually have hearing damage now. I have tinnitus from all the years of doing music. I have a constant ring in my ear. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I first got it, I was pretty alarmed by it. I found I found ways to navigate it. Um, no, it's not going to stop me from doing music. Um, yeah, those those headphones. Now I I had that's what I was using, you know, with the Paper Gods stuff, you know, way back in Arizona. It's the same. It was the same headphones. And what's funny is like when I first started doing that crap by myself, it was like I, I know I'm not hear, hearing this stuff right. Until I finally got those. So obviously, I no. But the thing that scared me 
is listening to what you and I had done recently with those Sennheisers and worried that, oh, good God, what did I send him? But, you know, thank God it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know, one thing that I, I would advise you to do is you can't get caught up in that whole sonic thing. Um, right. For years and years, I like through the 2000s, there were a couple times where Tara and I would start working on stuff and I would get discouraged because I would start obsessing about that, that the guitar sounded different in this song than from this song and the EQs were different. The thing with in flickers, what I, what I came up with my, my mixing technique was just mix it where it sounds good to my ears. And if it doesn't, yeah. if it doesn't meet any kind of parameters of unity of all the songs. Who cares if it sounds good? And ironically, in the end, it all came together because I just let all my guard down and just said, "I'm just going to make something that sounds good to me, and I'm not going to follow any rules." Like on in Flickers, there's some songs that I initiated that I purposely did without bass. Four of the songs on that album are just drums, guitar, and vocals. Well, they were, so. Yeah, and that's the philosophy. Is it, who cares how you get to the, your final destination? Just do what you can do to make it sound good and use any kind of sonic um, tools that you have. And I still take great pride in the fact that even though I get criticized from people every once in a while in a passive aggressive way for using cheap equipment, I make cheap equipment sound good. Oh um, yeah. I, I saw what you, what oh. you do. Hey, look, you know, a big bottom by spinal tap is all base. So there you go. Yeah. There was a guy one time that was talking to Tara. You remember this Tara? And he was totally ripping on the fact that we were using Sonic Foundry, it's since mm -hmm. moved to Sony and now to Magic, um, Acid and, and SoundForge, because most people consider that to be like not professional recording equipment. And he was going all off on about how he has all this top line stuff. And finally, I'm like, what have you done? What have you done with that top line stuff? Nothing. Right. Yep. But it goes back to our early days. Think about this, John. Wake. I can't even begin yeah. to tell you how well Wake has resonated with the, the, the people that are out there now doing dark wave and post-punk music. They see Wake as like this like sort of innovative album. We recorded that on a four track. And if you remember right, I had just some cheap, like $70 microphone. And I was holding the mic, trying to keep from banging into stuff. Everything we had was crap. Do you remember that bass? Crap. But the end result like sounds, I didn't even stay in tune half the time. Yeah. yeah. And I remember recording vocals, putting a blanket over my head to dampen the sound from the people driving in the parking lot outside. <laughs> the end result is all that matters. And I think actually having less pushes you to be more creative. And, yeah. um, you know, there's some of the songs on Wake. You should check it out sometime. There's, there, I, I saw quite a number of years ago, some guy with like, had a YouTube video of him playing guitar to the bells from Wake. Really? He, yeah, he's like jamming out to it. And- oh, um, Try and find that. And, I um, love that song. Yeah, that song, um, I sort of saw it as a throwaway song at the time, but now I listen to it and I'm like, that, that, that's a powerful song. Oh, I always really liked that song. Yeah, because uh, you remember with Wake, we, um, we set out to re-record re a lot of our old songs and it just wasn't working for whatever reason. So we just wrote new songs. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you remember this, there's a mistake on, I think, the song down there that we left in there because there was that girl that lived upstairs at my apartment. That weird girl? 
Yeah, that weird girl. <laughs> and well, we were we were recording that. Um, I was recording the guitar part, and she knocked on the door. And, yes, and, and um, I think Chris answered the door, and I was playing the guitar part, and I did a botched whammy or something because I was talking to her as a recording. I think she was asking, she was asking me to borrow colored pencils. Who <laughs> found her neighbor to borrow colored pencils? <laughs> I remember. I was like, I, I'm recording a guitar session here, and you want to borrow a colored pencil? Now, first of all, yeah, well, yeah, let's see it. Colored pencils? Yeah, they're in my pocket here. I'm like, yeah, I carry colored pencils with me. Stupid jokes you used to make about that girl. You know what's funny is that she she was um she used to always just knock on my door and ask me dumb questions all the time and I think she was just lonely. But uh, <laughs> it's weird. She, well, I tell you one thing, she used to vacuum her house at like three thirty in the morning. They're like, what oh, the is going on up there? You vacuum me? This is the time now. My one hour of sleep a night, you're going to vacuum? Really? I was like, okay, it's time for housework. They're He's not doing music downstairs anymore, so I'm going to vacuum now. It's like, what's she cute? Uh, you know, she probably had the hots for you or something. Well, she was she was cute. and But I remember the last time I saw her, she was like riding bikes with this really dorky guy, and they had bicycle helmets on, and it looked like Pee Wee Herman. Oh, that's right. She had a bike. Yeah, it's like riding this bike around, around like bike all the time. Yeah, but yeah, that was. Uh... Well, you can but anyways, a... that that's the kind of way we recorded. I'm like recording the guitar part. Someone's knocking on my door to borrow colored pencils, and somehow I managed to not botch the rest of the song. And I was like, okay, well, that's that's where it is. We'll just leave it there. But, um, you know, we we. If you remember right, we had all that junk equipment around there, a combination of my stuff and Will's stuff and your stuff. And and we we got that album. And when, uh, when I was getting that stuff mastered, a little quick backstory is I never was able to remaster that because I never had a decent copy of it. But what happened was my stepdad moved back to Michigan a couple of years ago and he brought this box over to my house because my mom died back in 97. He brought this box over to my house. And there, one of the boxes said, just said Lycia on it, on the side. And I was like, what is this? So I was going through that, and I found one of the original wakes that we had made that had never been played. It was pristine. Oh, really? It was just so I didn't play it. I went on to Amazon, and I bought a cassette player to USB, you know, with a USB connection. And yeah. First time I listened to that tape, I was digitizing it because I had such bad luck with all the other versions of Wake that when I would digit, when I would try to salvage them, there were so many dropouts. Well, right. as I was listening to this thing and digitizing it, I was like literally on pins and needles, like, oh my God, I hope there's not a dropout. And I got through one side, no dropouts. I did the other side, no dropouts. It was like, it was like a gift from heaven for my mom. It really was. Um, because that's what I remastered, had Martin from Attrition remaster, and it became the cassette that I pressed up, and then it was the um, vinyl that um, Circle oh, I Social. I, yeah, you did that. And when when I got the vinyl for Wake, I, I li almost literally cried when I was listening to that album because it was the lost album, and I got it from my mom. And Wake was finally yeah. realized for what it was supposed to be because the project version of Wake, if you listen to it, is quite altered. Um, Sam didn't have a lot to work with. He just had the rough, glitchy demos. And he was doing everything he could to try to restore these really horrible tapes that he had. And so he did a lot of things like he slowed things down um, slightly, added reverb to it. And while well, he did a real good job at that, I was never satisfied because it wasn't the original. And so to actually get the original out and have it come out on just this beautiful vinyl that Circle Social did for us and have it sound so damn good. 
It really was a gift. It was a gift. Yeah. And I'm so happy that because that to me, <clears throat> and Tara can attest to this. I I've been obsessed with trying to restore wake since probably 1995. Yeah. And I finally just gave up because I was like, there's no way, there's no way to salvage this. And then for this mystery box just to show up at, at my doorstep and for a copy of weight to be in there, it was just like a miracle. I know it's bizarre. And then I, I did that. I did the cassette and it just came out so good and circle social like we want to do this in vinyl. And I was like, wow. And that album has been received so well. Um, which I would say that in terms of Lycia albums, it might be up in the top five, four or five in terms of what people have really had great feedback about. I've had a lot of people tell me that is their favorite Lycia record. Mm -hmm. And there is also a whole, really? yeah, a lot of people love that album. And there's also a whole group of people out there that are obsessed with the demos. Um, yeah, they really are. And I, I get people quite often telling me that. Um, let me just give you an example. There was a, a guy, I think he lives in um, either Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And he told me that he listens to the Lycia demos every day when he's riding the train into work. And that it's the most important thing musically to him. His favorite thing musically ever. Um, right. um, that kind of stuff. I, I just, um, up about a week ago, I bought um, for, directly from Peter Newton of Clan of Zymox. He, he's no longer in Clan of Zymox. He hasn't been for decades, but he remastered their early demos for their, their first self-titled album and Medusa. And he- You bought something directly from him? From him, he made it available from his page. Oh. And so I bought it and he sent me the files of their early demos. And um, it reminds me a lot of our early demos. And, um, I understand what why- What you? What's that? What did he send you? Um, well, he, he made available to anyone that wanted to buy it um, 28 early demos of their self-titled album and Medusa demos, their, their demos they made for the Oh, album. oh, really? And some of them are- That's great. Are, yeah, some of them are just as raw as um, our demos, but I understand why people, after listening to the Clan of Zymox demos, I understand why people like our demos because there's some- there's some appeal to hearing songs in their raw state when you're writing them. There's a, mm -hmm. you know, as, as things get a, go farther in the process and they get more and more processed and they become more of a product. I think a lot of times they lose their spirit. No, I agree with you. I, I, and I listening to those demos, it's, it's magic. Well, yeah, and, because the, you could hear, in, in those you could hear, well, you could see the hand of the artist in it. Yeah. Um, so, um, like I was saying earlier, when I listen to our demo, those early demos, I, I hear past all the, the clicks and the pops and the hiss and the, you yeah. know, the horrible vocal performances on most of the songs. I mean, I understand that the, the vocals were horrible for, on a lot of those songs because, one, I was afraid to sing, as you well remember, and two... I just wrote the lyrics. I, I never even practiced. It's like, okay, here's, here's something I wrote. Let's give it a try. Put the blanket over my head. Let's go. All right. Well, you do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now I've been singing for so long. Now I just close my eyes and let it go. But back then I was petrified, you know, I was afraid, I was afraid just saying it was, you know, so insecure. But still, I can hear I can hear the song um, the way they are, what, the way I could hear them as finished things, you know, finished finish songs. You know, so, it's, uh, you know, go ahead, Tara. 
I was going to say, because I want to sort of consistently keep these around two hours. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Stop recording, but we don't have to hang up. We can still keep talking if you want. But I'm just going to go ahead and stop recording. So, All right, well, let's do our thanks. Um, thanks, John, for coming on board and doing this. Um, yeah, it was great. This is yeah. Tara's podcast, but thanks I guess I'm glad to make man of this. And, and obviously, you know. It was good is, talking to you guys again. It's been so damn long since I've seen you. Yeah. yeah, and this doesn't have to be a one-time thing. It's not like we can't do it again. And, you know, there's you guys got so much history that we really keep talking. <laughs> yeah, but, there's uh, tons. There's tons there's, more. And there's stuff to come. So, I, you know, I, I just wanted to tell you, John, that I, and Mike knows this, I'm super stoked that you guys are working together. Well, we're all working together again. And um, I can't wait. I to am see. too. Yeah, I can't wait to hear, and especially if you get that bass, um, I can't wait to hear some of those old songs again and new stuff. And um, hopefully Dave gets in the mix also. He will definitely be in the mix. Um, yeah. I think, so too. I think he's starting to get thaw out from his uh, deep freeze. So um, yeah. how yeah. long has it been since he... Since he hasn't done anything. It hasn't really been that long. I think um, it's probably been since the stuff we worked on in the Flickers. Um, oh. uh, but like I said, me and Dave are a lot of like, we go through periods where sometimes you just like, I, I'm just done. I just, I just need to recharge and I'm not going to do anything for a while. Um, and well, I think shit, you know me, that. I've like gone years without even Yeah, thinking. I mean, yeah. <laughs> And um, so I don't know how everything's going to be involved, but I just I dig working with, with um, the, the people that I've worked with. Um, you, Dave, I, and I'll be honest, I, I enjoyed working with Will, too, and I I would still be receptive to do a song with him, too, if he was ever interested. But um, we all know he would never be interested. <laughs> no, it's, you know, I, I, I've tried working with him. It's really hard. It really yeah, is. It is. It is. I mean, there was a couple times where there was a little bit of um, connection, but um, but nevertheless, I'm not thinking about that really. I mean, we got a we got a good thing going now, and we'll just go with it. And um, well, you know, to everyone out there watching, um, uh, I'm super excited uh, today. I listened to what potentially could be side A of the EP, and I'm super excited about it. It sounds sounds really good yeah well but i'm happy that's good and so i don't know what side b will be um but i'm i know i i still want to potentially work on that song that you sent to me that you sent me a little excerpt of it yeah uh, no I'll send, <laughs> I'll send you something else don't no, forget right. that all right i'll forget it but um, oh i i, I, I don't it know it was a decent piece it was a decent piece um, I, I when I heard it, the first thing I said to Tara was, "What I like about it is that when I first listened to it, I thought this isn't something that I probably would normally want to work on." But yeah, I don't know. But I hear it, and then I realize because that's the same thing I thought about, like a in failure and missed. But I thought, well, if, if you, but I thought, you know, what, if, if you do something cool to it. And, and like, and send it to me, and I think it's cool. Then, then I'll finish it. I mean, you know, I, oh, yeah. I trust you more than myself, honestly, right now. You have to look at all the some of some of the parts. I mean, I when I hear what you send to me, like I say, okay, this isn't something that I would initiate myself, but that's, but I can hear the same thing in in that that I would hear when you used to come over with the drum machine and the bass. And it brings out the exact same type of playing in me. Well, you know, I was a lot more confident back then. You, you know, you and I were both cocky then. We were young. You well, know, we were, we were sold on our vision. <laughs> now I'm like nervous, honestly nervous about sending you stuff. Like, oh man, he's going to think I'm a douchebag. No. Well, uh, I tell you, man. Uh, Trust me, I understand the insecurity aspect. <laughs> and Tara can uh, adjust to that. I, I, I still struggle on a daily basis 
on whether I'm just faking everybody. I, I, I constantly say, I'm just fooling everybody. The day is going to come when everyone's going to say, the jig is up. We all understand. Oh, well, wait a minute. You fooled. are just fooling everybody. So am yeah. I. So yeah. is Tara. Foster so Sandra. is Dave. Because it, that, that is what we're doing. I keep telling. How many times have I told you that, Nicole? I'm just pulling the wool over everybody's eyes. That's all well, it is. I'll, I'll, I'll stand within flickers against any album I've ever heard. Well, uh, no, wait, I, I'll, I'll tell you that, what, I, what I mean by that. It's like, yeah. at, Tchaikovsky was not pulling the wool over everybody's eyes. We are, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Unless I guess you talk to him, and then he probably thought he was pulling well, the wool over. He, he, he would think the same thing, too. Yeah. But, I, just to, to end this conversation, this is a good way to end, end our conversation. Um, years ago, we, we um, played a show with... Um, Steve Roach, a very famous ambient composer. And after yeah. the show, we hung out with him. And I said to him, you know how it is when you work on a song and you feel like absolute, like you failed? And he's like, no, I don't. He said that? Yeah, well, because he does ambient music and he's got a real good technique down. But we work right. on songs and our songs are generally about raw human emotions and so you're, you're laying it on the line you're laying like your personality and your life and you're just it's like standing naked in front of everyone at your school you're gonna feel insecure as hell man you, you right. know you're not you're not just doing soundscapes you're just you, you're you're exposing every nook and cranny of your insecurity and i and tara can i used to say you know people buy my pain Right. You know, people are like, your, your music is so important to me. And I'm like, but I don't feel good about it because it's about me expressing frustrations and all the right. stuff in the world that, you know, I struggle with and, and what comes with that. And I said it last week, I did a podcast last week and I was like saying, uh, you know, if if I didn't feel insecure, there wouldn't be in, there wouldn't be a Lycia. If I was a confident person, I wouldn't be doing this. This is what fueled me to do it. And so it's like right. a, a no a no win situation in that you feel like you're failing, but you feel compelled to still do it, and it's like this bizarre thing. Right. So, uh, I know. We're all in the same boat. We're, we're all Tara. Every time she does a vocal recording, I say, "Relax, it's going to be fine." She's insecure. Dave is insecure. I'm insecure. You're insecure. We're all insecure. But you know what? It the end product works, and so go with it, and we'll see. Yeah, you know, yeah I know Dave. Together. Dave is just as insecure as we are. We all are. We all are. Um. But that's what makes Lycia Lycia. Because if we okay. were secure, then our music probably wouldn't be very good. No, I agree. All right. Well, we got to wrap this up. So Tara, Tara's like probably 25 minutes over her two hours. So it's all good. All right. So, all right. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to stop recording right now. And then we all can right. still talk. Okay. All right.